Hello, CS40B. Um, in this video, I'm going to go over week two task instructions. Um, I also want to encourage you to complete the task from week one if you haven't done so, um, making sure that we don't procrastinate and wait until later on in the semester to be able to complete the task. As the task will pile up, you will fall behind tremendously. So making sure that you dedicate time to do all the tasks for each week and do not delay. So in this video, I'm gonna go over what we need to do as far as week two, briefly talk to you about some of the concepts you're gonna be learning um, in test out. So in week two, um, we are going to go through IP addressing and subnet. And in the prior course, CIS 40A, we have touched on this for a couple of weeks. I think most of you have seen how to um, set up IP addresses in your systems. And we've done labs in the prior class. But the purpose of the exercise is just to show you how you can configure as many of you will be doing this in the field and to be able to troubleshoot in the case if you have address conflict or if you need to design a network segment or isolate a network segment for security purposes. So in this week, we are gonna refer to test out chapter four. You can log in to test out directly to complete the task, but you can go to assignments or the module itself. In the first section, um, it goes over IP addressing. So you would click this page and it will provide you with the link for your lessons. And the first part of this lesson goes over number system, the difference between decimal, hexadecimal, and binary. And throughout a couple of your classes, I think we address the number system in our counting number that will be your decimal. Hexadecimal is a base 16 number system and we use this for addresses such as your memory addresses along with IP version six. So it's important to know what those number systems are. And if you forgot, you would need to go through the lesson. So once I click this link, it's going to take me to my test out as I have logged in. And it's going to load. You need to watch the video if you want to review the concept. And it's important that you go through the materials before you attempt the practice questions. Because if you attempt the practice questions without remembering some of the details, you will likely miss maybe a question or so, and you will not have a good score. And as you go through the video and the concepts throughout test out lessons, I suggest that you take notes so you can have a document like a Google Doc, or you can also use the bookmark feature so that way you can come back to it and review later. But I would recommend that you take notes on some of the details something that you need to remember from that lesson. Additionally, when you do the practice questions, if you have an incorrect response, it's always important that you review the results at the end after you submit your practice questions. It's going to give you the detail for the, the incorrect response. And it's going to refer to the section of the lesson that you can go back and review. Remember that these questions are to help you prepare for certifications and also job practices. So it's important that we understand the concept thoroughly while you're in cybersecurity or in IT. It's important that we know the concept and we know the practice by doing the lab and understand the overall um, skills for networking. So as you go through and watch the video, and they're not very long, you can take notes and then you can proceed. So as I complete this section, 
I will go through and look at additional facts. So these are gonna be the summary in document format as we talked about how binary values are used by the computer for everything that is stored. And the conversion for binary, I have also explained this in my video for CIS 40A. It is multiple up to in equivalence to the decimal value. Or we can refer to that as two to the nth value. It would use the base two with the exponent from the right-hand side, which is the least significant bit moving to the left. So if we start with the least significant bit, we would have exponent of one, and that is equivalent of two in decimal. And as we proceed, we would find that IP addresses, in IP version four, it uses decimal value, and it has octet. And each of the, the octet has eight bits, and so in combined the four octets, it's gonna give you 32 bits. Now in variation, we would see that the IP version four would have classes. Class A is gonna give you the most IP addresses, which has, which is what you commonly see in the network environment as we would see 10.0.0.1, for example. So with the class A, you would see that the first octet is gonna represent the network and the last three octet is gonna represent the host. And as we move into class B, class B is, has two octets that's gonna represent network and class C is commonly used at home or small networks. We would have three octets that would represent the network. And so in, when we're looking at the subnet mask, we would see 255, 255, 255 for class C. That is a classical address. And think of that as a network zone where it would be able to pinpoint which router it's gonna be able to send to so that way the router can be forwarding to the right segment of the network. So that's like the zip code in your neighborhood. So subnet mass is really important. It plays a really big role in how things can be routed and how things can get from a source to a destination correctly. So we need to review the classes of IP addresses version four. And when we look at the video for the IP address, Format, it also explains what I briefly go over in subnet mask. And to really break it down, when you see the 255, all the bits in, the, in that particular octet is turned on. And so when the host bits are zero, you would see that those octets are gonna represent as zero. Now, in the class B address, sometimes we can lean into a different class using the subnet mass manipulation so that way we can have more addresses. So for example, if I design a network using this IP address and eventually I have maxed out in that network and I need to add additional segment I can then use the subnet mask to create a classless address using subnetting in order to have additional addresses. That's one way that we can use subnetting for. We can also use subnet to create isolation or separation in the network environment where things need to be routed and filtered and screened through security appliances and routers. So for example, if I need something on the DMZ, I can use a different IP address in a different segment so that way it needs to be routed so we can screen all the traffic coming into that network segment and out of that network segment. So as you can see, IP addressing plays a very important scheme in the networking overall, 
but it is also very important in security design and also monitoring. So when we look through, we would learn the classes of IP addresses. Class D and class D E, we would not use. D is used for multicast and E is used for experimental. So in IP version four, we would use class A, B, and C. And in the section where it talks about public and private IP addresses. So anything within our network, we can consider that as your private IP addresses. And in that we would use the appropriate IP to be able to accommodate all the devices and the appliances that we need to connect in that particular network. So the administrator would then, or the network engineer would design the network and select the type of IP addresses that would be suitable for the network's need and scalability. The public IP addresses is then needs to be acquired through service provider who, uh, who got the public IP addresses from the, the agency or the association. So you need to differentiate between the, the public and the private IP addresses. So when you're setting a static IP address, for example, for your printer, that's inside your network and that will be using the private IP address compared to when you're using a router or public facing devices, like your home router would have a public IP address. Now through protocols and services, we can use all your appliances would then use maybe one public IP. Sometime in this case, if we have a very large scale network, like an enterprise network, we would have a group of public IP addresses. For example, if you're looking at Google, they would have a range of public IP addresses that they have registered for to be able to use for their data center and their servers. So in the case, if we need to host a website, that website is tied to a web server and a DNS. And that DNS would then need to have a public IP address. So we would then need to sign up with our service provider who would have the public IP address for our use. So in the case, if you build a brand new network, you can contact your service provider, your internet service provider in that region and be able to establish the service, accumulating the public IP address that you need for the server roles and the systems like your routers to be able to handle or pass traffic back and forth into a specific area of your network or and then out to the public network. So when we go through these lessons, take notes and write down the important points that's gonna help you with the practice questions. In the next section, it goes over subnetting. And as I mentioned before, subnets is very important. It's a way that we can integrate network design and implement some security areas in our network or in the scale of the network that is very large. For example, I might have offices in New York, DC, Los Angeles, and other part of the country or the world. I would need to think about how I can use subnetting to be able to manage my network with all the devices that are connecting, including bring your own device to work. So, when we go through the subnet, and this is an area that a lot of people struggle with. So if it takes you a little bit to understand subnetting, that's okay. And I know that in the prior class, we talk about subnet, I gave you a workbook to use. So it's always good to use multiple tools to be able to understand subnet. And there are subnet calculator available online, but we always want to check our work for IP version four subnetting and when you're pursuing CCNA certifications um, or other networking certifications, 
subnetting questions will come up. Cisco will likely ask you about subnet, subnetting and how you can subnet correctly. So when we go through, it talks about how class A has the most hosts. That means it has let network. And for class B, it has less hosts and class C is the least. So when we see there are some default example, now usable, actual usable addresses do not end with zero or 255 or 254. So in the case where if we are using a dot zero like this, that is a network address, that's just gonna zone in on what network or which network the system is communicating from. And it's gonna refer to our subnet mask to be able to narrow down which network. And so when we look at this, we would see that the subnet by the default example, we can only have one, the number of subnet addresses is gonna be one and the host is this. So to really understand this, you would see that we would use things like MassBit or we would see this as CIDR or CIDR. And when you are more familiar with this, you would see that it would, you would be able to reference it very quickly on how many of the subnets you can use based on the equation. Now in my CIS 40A, I demonstrated this using a table, but you can also use calculation. There are other ways that you can calculate this. So when, you, when you're looking at the actual mass value, this is two to the N minus two, and that's gonna give you 200 and 240 right here for the octet, and that's gonna be CIDR 20. But when we're looking at CIDR 21, you notice that the mass value here, we're going from 240, which is a slash 20, to slash 21, it added another eight bits. And it will continue to do that when we increase the CIDR value from 21 to 22, we add another eight bits. 23, we add another eight bits to the previous, so 252. Right, and then we, we're gonna, I'm sorry, uh, for 252, when we go to from 252 to 254, you notice that we, this is eight, and here we're gonna increase to four and two, and then zero, so it decreased. And so with that, you are gonna go through, take a look at this, and it's gonna illustrate on how you can calculate the subnet mass based on the provided example. And if you're more familiar with the binary, that's okay, you can use it as a binary. And when we do a dot one and so on. So how do they come up with the IP addresses? The system convert everything the, the value 192 into the binary equivalent. And it will translate that into your octet. So for the math section, it shows you how you can do that. And so you should watch this video on how we would be able to take the bits and subtract to be able to find the, how many hosts that we have. Because if you apply for a network engineer or a network technician position or even security position, sometimes you need to go back and look at how many hosts are communicating. For example, if your host in that segment is impacted by a, a certain type of attack, we need to make sure we understand that range of IP and how that range of IP is impacted. So for the subnet section, it does a really good job with demonstrating on how you can look at subnet in various locations for an enterprise network. 
and we can go through the subnet design. Now for the network engineers, in order to add additional segment to the network, let's say that the company is expanding, they have additional buildings um, and additional floors to be able to add systems and users. So that means that we would need to come up with a way where we can expand the network through subnet planning and design. And you want to be able to prepare for this, making sure that or your system is um, is connected and communicating and being able to make sure that we understand. Now, in the demonstration, it shows you on how you can configure the subnet in your router, and that's the core in this class. We're going to spend some of the next few chapters going through. So make sure that we go through and looking at how subnets are configured with specific routers and also on the system, you would do some of this on Windows-based system and or your routing and, and layer four switches and so on. So it's important that we know how to be able to manage this as we are going through the course, because without understanding and knowing how to configure routing and be able to pull up routing tables, you will have deficiency when you go into cybersecurity. It's very, very important that you understand network well. So after you go through and accomplish the subnet mask lab and the subnet mask configuration, this is the second practice for class B. And when you do the lab, if you start the lab, and if you are not doing well on the lab, you can always start over before you score the lab. So in this case, I'm working with the device. And so when you click on that device, remember that all the prior lessons and exercises come in handy here. So we would then press return and we have to enable and go into configuration mode so that way we can modify based on the task that's given here. So it tells you that you need to set up your subnet mask and this is using fast ethernet zero slash zero, that's your interface. So in order to configure that interface, you need to go into that interface and be able to set that up. So what I did was I created all the pages for your exercises and your practice questions. So if you are going through test out, you can go through sequentially and then be able to accomplish those things. That's the easiest way. And it automatically scores and point your score directly to Canvas. But if you want to use the link inside your Canvas, I added the links there for you. So that way you can click through it before you go through each of the section. So after we have the, the subnet math section, there is a section on route summarization. This is a way that we can look into the router and interrogate or see its cable. In the case where if you are troubleshooting your network segment or in the case if you are monitoring or assessing or analyzing your network communication, it's important that you know how to do this. So route summarization video is provided there and you can go through and look at the summarization facts. And so we can have it automatically set up where it would identify which network based on how it can route. So sometime it would be shortest path, sometime it all depends on the actual protocols. 
So when we're using auto summarization, we would refer to EIGRP, where open shortest path first does not provide auto summarization. RIP is a little bit outdated, but companies are still using RIP and RIP version two has less flaws than RIP version one. So what you can see is that you can disable automatic summarization as sometimes that can also be a security area. So routers communicate with other routers by looking at what kind of path, what kind of network it's connected to, and that's how it's able to identify which one it can pass that particular traffic to. And so subnetting plays an important role in routing and also in network design. In the next section for IP version six, there's not required exercise, but I encourage you to go over IP version six information as IP version six is very crucial in today's network. Most network would have both version being used Many of the networks might have transitioned completely to version six. So for many of you who are working as apprentices or planning to work in the field, you will be facing IP version six. And IP version six is gonna give us more IP addresses. The IP address is longer and it's using hexadecimal. So we have more variation of the IP addresses based on probability. And so in many of the protocols that use IP addresses like IPSEC, IP version six now is supportive of the, those, those type of protocols. Now quality of services, it, for QoS, it's mostly working with IP version four, but there are features that you can add on to be able to manage version six. And so version six is slightly different. It uses flow label for the field in the packet header. And packet header is like what you write on an envelope, right? Where it's coming from, where it's going to when you're sending postal mail. So packet header is used by systems to be able to identify how it can transmit information to another system for that particular packet. So the flow is going to be important as flow label is gonna tell the system where it's sending to and where it's coming from and the information about the packet. So when we look through, we would see the implementation of IP version six, the example on what it looks like. And remember that it's hexadecimal value. You can also shorten it if it has zero in the middle by using a double colon. I think we talked about that before in our prior class. So here to break down, you would see that there are the value indicated or the part of the IP version six it would have for routing information, how it's gonna narrow down to where it's gonna get to for the subnet. So for your internet service provider, that's gonna be part of the, the, this section. And then for your um, routing and your automation for your global routing, that's gonna be the first three digits. And then it's gonna come down to the site. It's kind of like how you are zooming in on the earth, which is global, then you zoom gonna zoom down to the region, and you're gonna zoom down to the city, and you're gonna zoom down to the street. So the indication for the IP version six, the format of it, we need to understand how the breakdown of it would be and how it's used. 
Okay. So for the next part, uh, we're going to talk about dynamic host configuration protocol. This is used to assign IP address. So in this section, you're going to see that you are going to use server um, simulation to be able to do the configuration for the lab. So it's going to show, and then in some cases, we can also use security appliance or our network appliances to be able to do that. As you would see that DHCP is handled by your home router. So it shows you how you can manually bind DHCP. So setting up the server role and the scope for your IP addresses is not enough, right? Um, in order for additional network administration, we need to make sure that there are bindings that's involved and in the case if we need to do DHCP relay where we can have one system refer to the other system and you would see that there are many different DHCP servers that's being used in the case if we might have different group of addresses. Uh, for example, one for, for the internal network, one for uh, you know, setting up the scope additionally using the relay um, for remote workers and so on. So making sure that we go through the HCP information thoroughly, understanding what a lease is, how we can set up a pool of IP addresses. And binding is just associating from the physical address, which is the MAC address to the IP address. Why is that important? Because ultimately MAC addresses is gonna be handled by the switches and the IP addresses are gonna be handled by the router. So in order to narrow down to that section of the network, right, we have to bring it down to the switch level and we need to narrow it down to the physical system in that segment. So binding is very important. And also you would see that there are examples here on how servers can be used outside of your local area network for IP addresses. Um, and then for the last section of our lesson is going to be on DNS, domain name system. This is going to give you your .org, .gov, .net, .com. And so in the case where we configure the DNS, we would do that on the server. And the example in this video shows you how you can configure this using Windows Server 2019 or even the earlier version. So the server operating system is used to configure, install and configure the role. So you need to install that particular DNS package. And once you do that, you can configure your zone how it can associate IP addresses to that particular .org, like comptia.org or you know, um, .gov or .com. And when you're visiting a website, for example, if you're going to google.com, right, um, that web server is handling the requests for HTTP, HTTPS, and then serving you the HTML, but it is connecting to the DNS. So that's very important. And so in security, we need to understand the role of DNS, the flaws in DNS, right? So when you go through, you would see the configuration and how these records play a very important role because attack all right, DNS poisoning can impact your records. So we need to know how to configure your DNS host records, your CNAME, and so on. And DNS is normally tied with Active Directory. So we can have a certain host name tying into a certain IP address, certain servers. So you might have child servers that is 
assign a certain IP addresses. So we need to make sure that we can configure that. And Active Directory is going to allow us to manage the objects, the, the subjects, which are the systems and the users, and how we can control their level of access in our network environment. So in this section, make sure that we go through and then understanding how to troubleshoot the DNS records. And in some cases, I often see that, you know, some of the interview questions ask you when you cannot connect to a certain DNS, you can troubleshoot by using command line, such as flushing that DNS um, and then changing your configuration. But DNS records is so important in security and I can't emphasize it enough. This is how they can redirect if they have access to your records and modify your records information, they can perform also additional attack with it. So um, in the case where if you're looking at phishing attack, redirection is going to require you to modify some of the, the, the records for that DNS instead of luring the, the user to, um, instead of allowing the user accessing their network environment, they can redirect it, send the users to their alternative servers. Okay, so I wanna emphasize that making sure that we accomplish the tasks for this upcoming week. I know that the due date is gonna be um, midweek next week, but letting you know that you need to take the time to get through these exercises and reviewing or trying to understand the concept to be able to accomplish the task. When you see the little mouse icon, those are your lab exercises. And then the practice questions is usually at the end of that section. And again, refer to my announcements and additional information in Canvas. Um, if you have any questions, make sure you contact me via message on Canvas or send me an email. If you need help or if you have any concern, please let me know. Thank you for watching this video and I hope you have a great week.